Hi, I'm happy to be keynoting the Barton College Friends of the Library's annual meeting. I'm going to share with you some serendipitous type uh, events in my life that led me to where I am today. So much of what's happened to me uh, appears to be serendipity. For example, I am a professor at Fayetteville State University, a job that I was offered after going to that, that college's library to do a reading. Afterwards, the provost uh, came to my book signing, purchased a book, and then said, when are you going to come down here and be our writer in residence? And I said, oh, it would be a dream job, but it's 100 miles away from where I live. And he said, send me your resume. We'll make it happen. That was almost 20 years ago. I'm now a tenured professor of English at Fayetteville State University. So that's just one example of how serendipity has worked in my life. It's not all serendipity, but there have been some big ifs. And I think about how blessed I am that I was born to the people that I was born to, that I have had the teachers that I, that I had and have had the family that I have, have had and the environment, the loving environment and nurturing environment that I grew up in and, and still am a part of. So I'm, I'm titling this address, Big Ifs. If I had not grown up with a grandmother in the house, I might not have the appreciation that I do for the power of oral traditions. My, grandmother's, my grandmother, uh, Annie, was my mother's mother. She lived with us. And my father's mother, Mama Boston, lived just two blocks away. So whenever, every day when I came home from school, both of them uh, were at the house, uh, humming hymns, uh, spouting proverbs, and passing on uh, family stories, as well as doing a whole lot of cooking. If I had not read this book of poems when I was quarantined with the red measles at age five, particularly the poem, The Land of Counterpain, uh, the collection is by Robert Louis Stevenson, I might not have realized that poetry makes music with words. If my mother had not driven me home from first grade, I might not have recited my first poem to her. The poem was about the four seasons, and it went like this. There are four seasons in each year, winter, summer, spring, and fall. Which one do you like best of all? I like winter. That's when the wind gives its pleasant call. My mother was so surprised that I had made up this poem that she parked the car, even though we were just two blocks from home, and she asked me if I would say it again. And when I said it the second time, she wrote it down. So what you see on the screen is uh, my attempt at the end of my first grade year to copy her handwriting in cursive. And as you can see, the year was 1962. If my mother had not written that poem down, I surely would have forgotten the rhyme. She kept it in her dresser drawer for over 30 years until I came back to her as a published author and asked whatever happened to the poem. And she pulled a raggedy old envelope out of the drawer, out of the dresser drawer, and there was the poem. Uh, that is really the only reason that I remember the poem and am able to share, with, share it with you today and with school children when I do author visits to, uh, to K-12 through schools. If my father had not been a high school printing, printing teacher, I would not have known the thrill of seeing my work in print at such an early age. My mother asked my father if he would have the students in his class print some of my early poems on the printing press in his printing presses in his classroom. So he uh, used uh, the, the, my poems as typesetting exercises for my students, and meaning that I got to see my work in print, not in book form, but on little postcard size cardstock at a very early age before the dawn of desktop publishing, PCs, laptops, or laser printers. If the school librarian at Edgewood Elementary School, uh, which I attended in Baltimore, had not shared a snowy day and the tales of Anansi, I might not have been exposed to any diverse books as a child because there were few titles, few books that I could turn to for characters who looked like me. I could probably count on one hand the number of diverse books that I read in elementary school. If I had known then that I needed and perhaps even deserved to see myself in books, I might have felt deprived, but I had no idea that I 
and that I deserved to see myself in books. So I was happy with the reading material that I had at the time. Fortunately, the teachers at All Black Edgewood Elementary School exposed us to black history every chance they could. If the teachers have not taught me about freedom fighters like Harriet Tubman, I might never have gone on to write Moses when Harriet Tubman led her people to freedom, which was my first Caldecott uh, medal, uh, honor medal winning book. If my fourth grade teacher had not made us memorize I Too by Langston Hughes, I might not have understood until much later that poetry could be an act of resistance. If I had not read County Cullen's poem, Incident, during our Harlem Renaissance unit in eighth grade at predominantly white, well, majority white, uh, Baltimore Friends School, I might not have decided to do a research paper on him. The poem, Incident, which you can see on the screen, is about an eight-year-old boy who encounters a white boy in Baltimore, my hometown, uh, during one summer and is the victim of a racial epithet at the hands of the white boy. The white boy called him the N-word. The poem touched me very deeply about racial injustice and I decided to do a research paper on County Cullen. If my English teacher had not written only one line below the grade of B on that research paper, and the line that he wrote was, did you write this? I might never have vowed to use my voice to make myself heard and to fight injustices. I did not know at the time that the teacher had given me a grade of B because that reflected his expectations of me rather than the A that I deserved. He could not find any errors in the paper but gave me a B because he simply could not believe that I had written the paper. So I could relate to Arturo Schomburg, another Harlem Renaissance figure who was slighted by his fifth grade teacher. His fifth grade teacher told him that African descendants had no history worth noting. That set Schomburg on a lifelong quest to prove that teacher wrong and to document history of the African diaspora. Schomburg became a noted bibliophile of the Harlem Renaissance. His work benefited poets and visual artists of that period who came to him uh, for bibliographies and also to see art in his collection. The collection eventually became part of the Negro History and Literature Collection at New York Public Libraries, uh, Harlem branch, 135th Street branch. That branch is now known as the Schomburg Center, one of the world's leading repositories of African and African American uh, culture and history. Schomburg's collection was so vast that his wife told him that before the collection was given was uh, donated to the New York Public Library that either the books and art and artifacts had to go or she and the children would go. So Schomburg even had bookshelves in his bathroom. If I had not gone to readings by poets of the black arts movement when I was a young adult, I might never have declared myself a poet. At that time, before that time, I had never uh, met a real live author uh, I just assumed when I was growing up that the people who wrote the books that I loved to read out of the library uh, were one, either uh, dead, and I had no clue that authors got paid to do that work. But when I went to poetry readings during the Black Arts Movement of the uh, 70s, I, something awakened in me, and it was that I could write poetry that didn't need to sound like the, the Western canon. During that same period, my father took me to see a play uh, by Antezaki Shange, a poet. The play was called A Choreo Poem, and it was, uh, the title is, was, is, For Colored Girls, 
who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. That poet, that work was an epiphany for me, not only because it was, uh, the cast was uh, all African American females, but because the play showed me that poetry had a life beyond the page and could be performed on the stage. I eventually uh, went on to write not just for adults, but for children. If I had not become a mother, I might never have been exposed to the multicultural books that were appearing in the late 20th century when my own children were very young. One of my kids' uh, favorite books was Tar Beach, written and illustrated by Faith Ringgold. In that book, the main character, Cassie Lightfoot, can fly. I want to read an excerpt. I can fly. Yes, fly. Me, Cassie Louise Lightfoot, only eight years old in the third grade, and I can fly. That means I am free to go wherever I want for the rest of my life. There are people like me who fly in their dreams. And I thought everyone did until I asked some people on, a, on an elevator one day and only a few of them did. We were all writers, so you ask, you ask other creatives that type of question. And so that's how I found out that not everyone flies in their dreams. It's very invigorating. So if you haven't done it, I don't know if you can try to do it, but maybe you should try to do it. If I had not grown up in the church, had a grandfather who was a minister, and served as a first lady for a while myself, spirituality might not be woven into so many of my books. If my father had not been a jazz fan, I might not have written five books about jazz and jazz musicians. If I had not lived in High Point, North Carolina, where John Coltrane grew up, I might not have written the book Before John Was a Jazz Giant, a song of John Coltrane. And had I not written and researched that book, I might not have found out that my great aunt was his third grade teacher. If my father, had not taken me to see Lady Sings the Blues as a teenager, I might not, have be, uh, might not be such a big Billie Holiday fan. She might never have become my muse, and I might never have written the book Becoming Billie Holiday. If my father had not served during World War II and my son uh, had not been an artist, I might not have written You Can Fly, the Tuskegee Airmen. So I want to return to the theme of flying for just a second and read to you the opening poem from You Can Fly, the Tuskegee Airmen, which is illustrated by my son, Jeffrey Weatherford. Head to the sky. No matter that there are only 130 licensed black pilots in the whole nation. Your goal of being a pilot cannot be grounded by top brass claiming blacks are not fit to fly. Your vision of planes cannot be blocked by clouds of doubt. The engine of your ambition will not break for walls of injustice, no matter how high. The sky's no limit if you've flown on your own power in countless dreams, not if you've raised homing pigeons on Harlem rooftops or watched crop dusters buzzing over rows of cotton, not if you've gazed at stars and known God meant for you to soar. The last line of that poem, God meant for you to soar, is a message that I like to pass along uh, to children uh, whenever I visit schools. And it's a lesson that's inherent in many of my biographies that chronicle the lives of people who faced adversities and overcame them to do great things in their own lives, to battle injustices, to uh, leave creative legacies, and, and the like. I had a childhood that was steeped in history, but that didn't have to be either. If my parents had not bought back land that had been in our family since Reconstruction, history might not matter so much to me today. 
If I had not grown up during the Civil Rights Movement, a movement that in some, in some circles is now fading from memory, I might not be so committed to chronicling the Civil Rights Movement and the freedom struggle in my books. If I had not moved to North Carolina as a young adult, I might not have written Freedom on the Menu, the Greensboro sit-ins, which chronicles a seminal event in the Civil Rights Movement. If I did not believe that children demand and deserve the truth, I would not tackle tough topics in children's books. I believe that it's never too early to raise an anti-racist. I do this through children's books because children have a stricter sense of justice than we as adults do. They have a more absolute sense of right and wrong. That's why they like fairy tales, because the uh, villains get vanquished. They're never, they're never around at the end of a fairy tale. Kids deserve a truer and fuller history. They deserve and demand the truth. So I write anti-racist children's books to bear witness for the marginalized, to center African Americans and our agency, to expose the roots of racism, to correct bias and omissions, to counter homegrown prejudices, and to arm children as allies and anti-racist. So I create books in which children of color can see themselves, in which white children can see children of color, and that spark much needed conversations between children and adults so that children will learn to question injustice. No matter how much context I provide before sharing my stories and poems with children, stories and poems that may be set during the uh, slavery or the civil rights era, children always have this question afterwards. Did that really happen? Why did it happen? And who made that stupid rule? And I tell them, adults made that stupid rule. The children's responses could not be more appropriate if I had scripted them. My books have won scores of awards, but the greatest reward is knowing that my books reach so many young readers, children I will never meet in places I may never visit. My books shine a spotlight not only on injustices, but also on inspiring lives and complex personalities. My new book, Beauty Mark, a verse novel of Marilyn Monroe, depicts Marilyn as a painter, poet, gardener, cook, book lover, ally, political progressive, proto-feminist, survivor of sexual abuse, and the brains behind her brand. Here's the book trailer featuring the opening poem, entitled, Stand Still. Stand Still. I am nude about to be sewn into the dress that I paid Oscar winner Jean-Louis $12,000 to design. The sequined second skin I will wear to sing Happy Birthday to Jack Kennedy, the president. I was coiffed by the same beautician who does First Lady Jackie Kennedy's hair. Nothing in my Norma Jean beginnings pointed toward this moment. This is no accident, though. I rehearsed the song until it became my breath. I exhale memory after memory while a stylist stitches me into history. For hours, I stand perfectly still as my shimmery silhouette takes shape. I am silvery as a movie screen. Hollywood's old guard scoffed that I could not act my way out of a paper bag. What did they know?
My other new book, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha Franklin, The Queen of Soul, of course honors the legendary soul singer. One thing I learned in researching that book is that Aretha Franklin gave benefit concerts to support the civil rights movement. I'm going to read an excerpt uh, to you from that book. G-R-O-O-V-E. Aretha finds her groove when she's rocking R&B. No woman of her time has more chart toppers than she. R-I-G-H-T. For the Civil Rights Movement for Racial Equality, Aretha raises funds and gives concerts for free. Someday we'll all be free. G-R-E-A-T. Aretha's crowned as Queen of Soul, our own royalty. She wins awards and accolades and more than one degree. P-R-O-U-D, when the first black president is sworn into history, the queen rejoices with my country tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty. H-U-M-B-L-E, Aretha tours her queendom from sea to shining sea. But in Detroit, down to earth, she's known just as Riri. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, the queen of soul blessed us with a golden legacy, but she would probably call it the gift that God gave me. Please follow me on social media and visit my website for more information about my books and appearances. Thank you very much.